Spotify has been doing open source for the past 10 years. However, we're still not treating open source on equal terms to our core business activities. For us to truly succeed with our open source bets, we need to elevate open source from a perk to work. So I think for you as an engineer or a team lead or for the, for the business as a whole, open source is hugely important. It is everywhere in our tech landscape. And in this talk, I'll outline how we want to change our approach to open source to optimize it for a more positive impact on your career, your team, and again, our business objectives. So we know that open source is work and it's also hard work. So we need to ensure that we spend our resources wisely and set you up for success. So when you walk away from this talk, I would like to, for you to walk away uh, thinking of open source more in terms of ownership and maintainership rather than release of code but also on the importance of defining success to measure impact and why essentially the measurement of success is actually crucial for how we can actually prioritize open source in the future. And again, also to feel optimistic about Spotify's belief in open source. We have, we have used it for since our, we began as a company and we are continuing to mature uh, on how we look at open source. And this is just one step further towards seeing this more as an integrated way of working at Spotify rather than a, a, like a sidekick or a hobby. So just a short introduction to me, I spent 10 years running an open source company before joining Spotify, um, building that community up to around 300,000 users. And I've also spent like five years in enterprise IT. So I also know that the topic of ownership and dedicating resources to a specific topic is, is essential for that topic success. So these are the kind of experiences I'll try to bring into this talk and share with you. So also just a bit of a discussion. The open source program office uh, is engaged in the open source topic as a whole. So we look at everywhere open source is kind of part of the company, but for this specific talk, we're only focusing on the actual ways of working with open source and also more of a focus on like how we publish open source. There's multiple other things, such as like how we consume it, how we contribute upstream and so on. And that's just out of scope for this like shorter, shorter talk. So it's not that we don't care about it. It's just not for this one. So a quick agenda. Let's just start off by talking about why we even do open source. Why do we as a company actually care about this? And why do we want to put resources into it? Again, sorry if I, I use like <laughs> HR speak of calling people resources, but here I'm generally referring to like people and time and money and so on. So resources not about people. So <clears throat> with that, um, we're going to look at how do we do open source work at Spotify today? And then also where are we challenged as a company of, of either like working with open source projects today, where do we see a lack of priority and where can we improve? And that's kind of where we're going to end up with this. This talk is like, how can we make open source uh, better in the future for all of us? So going into answering the question, like, why do we even care about this? Why do we want to do it? So there, of course, there are some, Spotify specific reasons for caring about open source. And then there's also these more generic industry-wide uh, reasons for, for engaging into open source. And we have a bit of both. Um, so first of all, one of, one of the more generic reasons is like telling growth, attraction, and ret retention. When we talk about growth, then engaging into an open source project as a maintainer or engaging in as a, as a contributor to another project is a growth opportunity. It means that you start thinking about other things than just code. There is a community to engage with. There are uh, different stakeholders, both inside of Spotify and also externally to think about. There's a lot of communication to be done. There's a lot of expectations to be set and so on. And that is generally like a growth opportunity for someone who wants to move on just like focused on the engineering parts. Then there's the attraction part, like putting our code outside in the open is a way for us to share what actually goes on inside of Spotify, to see what's actually behind the application that people use to stream music, showing that we actually solve like very interesting both machine learning problem, data problems, and, and a ton of other things that people even had no idea was actually behind this little app they're using every day. Um, so it's a good way of actually showing the interesting problems we, we solve and thereby also attract talent from the outside. It might also be a good reason for the people from outside to actually engage with people who already work at Spotify and thereby actually seeing what kind of people actually work here and what kind of things we actually care about. And then there's the retention thing. If people can engage in open source where they work and have these, you could call them passion projects, it's also a good retention mechanism. It gives you a greater deal of control over your work uh, and therefore can have a positive impact on you as well. Then we have a more specific Spotify specific reason, which is the financial sustainability and viability of our open source work. As you probably know, we are investing heavily into Backstage and 
we want to do that long term. We want to be able to be here in, in, in years and say, we have found a way to have a sustainable way that's not just an expense. Um, so we want to find a way forward to make our open source work sustainable as well. Then there's the part about influencing the industry. We want to have influence over the things that we depend on. We have open source pretty much everywhere. And we also want to engage in the industry, both by showcasing what we we use inside of Spotify to solve problems, but we also want to influence how other projects approach these problems so they fit with our way of working. And then there's the last part, which is, of course, adoption and contributions and community engagement, uh, having your code used by someone else and also getting bug fixes and changes from the community as well is also a, a, a big value for us. Like all these four reasons also play into, you could say, our brand strategy around open source, because we shouldn't, we shouldn't fool ourselves. This is also about branding the company towards speaking about these things we care about. But it shouldn't be hollow. It shouldn't be a shallow thing we want to do. We want to do the right things internally to also have a good story to tell externally. So these four reasons also go into establishing a brand story around open source, but of course, with substance. So let's talk about where we are. Um, the current state of open source inside of, of Spotify. Uh, some numbers first. <clears throat> we have around 230 uh, public GitHub projects. Not all of them are active. Uh, actually, looking at the numbers now, we probably have around 125 projects we deem actually active. But we have 233 right now on our, on our organization. We have nearly 400 members. About half of these people have actually contributed to one of our projects. And then we've received 17,000 pull requests from thousands of external contributors over the years. Then let's look at the inside of Spotify. We have already the basics in place in regards to policies and processes and legalese. That also means that we have a good mindset inside the company of, of releasing open source, both on the management side and on the engineering side, and also on the legal side. This is not a matter of convincing anyone if, if open source are good or not. This is more of going down into a business decision, actually, if it makes sense and we can actually get some value out of open source. And that's a good mindset to have. We also have a history of a project that's actually been successful in the areas as well. We have specifically like Backstage, Hue, Clio, Pedalboard, and a lot of other projects actually that's, that gain traction across um, the industry. So we are in a good place and we, we've done some good things already. So let's dive into some some more metrics and let's talk about where we are a bit challenged in, in our engagement into open source. So if we look at activity on our repositories on average over time, then you'll see this chart here is that it initially shows a lot of initial activity. Um, uh, we see a lot of commits happening in the repository in the first couple of months. And then quite naturally the, the uh, activity kind of just slows down over time until it, it's basically nothing. Um, and that is quite natural. Only 2% of our open source projects basically make it. So it's quite natural that, that a lot of our projects kind of fizzle out. Um, you can say that the challenge here is that we don't actively actually decide that it's done. We just let them be and just let them slowly de die. So it just stands still and it just slows, slowly loses value. There might come a contribute, <laughs> there might come some external contributor by our project ask a question, raise an issue, create a pull request, and no response is given. So there's many reasons for this. Of course, like maybe we didn't actually care so much about the code we released, or maybe the people who actually cared about it moved on to a different role inside the company, or maybe they changed job and so on. And then what happens? Another piece of data is number of repositories compared to our activity over time. So of course you can see quite naturally the blue line keeps going up and up until it hits the 233 repositories we have in there. But what's also interesting is that we look at activity of pull requests over time, and this is pretty stagnant. So you can see we actually go from around 40 repositories to 230, and the activity remains somewhat the same. So this, this means that every time we release something, we kind of move away from what was there before. So we kind of move from one shiny thing to the next thing. We care about what is kind of on top of mind now. We release something. We're very excited about this for a short period of time. And then we move on to the next thing that's released. So we kind of see these like uh, releases and then moving on. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule, but this is the, the general trend that you can see. Then there's about working hours. A lot of our open source work actually happens outside of working hours. 
57% of all commits are done outside of working hours based on like local time or on weekends. This is pretty much on par with the industry. Around 50% of all uh, open source contributions are deemed to be volunteer work based on like what time of day it's committed. This was per a 2014 study. There's a, there's a link in the notes at the end of this, the slides if you want to read that. Why is it a problem for Spotify? Well, it's a problem for us because we, we actually put these projects into the world to represent us as a company. We take ownership of the, of the project. We have the, our name on it. And there should probably also be a connection between how many hours we then dedicate to these projects internally, like working hours. Um, because it's not really sustainable to depend on, on free labor. It can either lead to maintain a burnout or people just simply move away and, and do more interesting things. And you can say as an employee, if you have the choice between working on an internal project that might go into your promotion story or working on an open source project that you don't really have dedicated working hours to, then what will you choose? So we see this as a problem as well. And we do want to want to change this number. So let's also talk about our supply chain. Um, we don't really have a strategy for how we engage with the upstream strategy, uh, upstream dependencies. We have limited involvement in the key technology that drives our, our industry. And you can say it happens very much on a tactical level in the sense that if a team depends on something, they might see a bucket zone. So they might just pull the code in and fix it internally and then live with that version being behind. Or they might actually commit it back to the project. But we don't have a strategy for taking our strategy, like cloud strategy and IT strategy and actually figuring out like, where do we actually want to engage as a company on a strategic level. Like we don't have a strategy for how are we going to influence these big parts that we actually highly depend on. So this is also something we, we should start caring about. So we take more ownership of the general environment we're in rather than just depending on individual action here and there. So this is both in regards to like financial and non-financial support. Um, we as a company should have a better idea of where is the important parts of our infrastructure that we need to either support with time and development time or with money so we can ensure that the maintainers are, are doing the right thing. And then there's the last thing. Um, if we talk about quality, we have to go back to the idea of metrics. And if we, we set a, a set of basic metrics to kind of indicate quality, we can talk about our, one of our repositories should probably not have security vulnerabilities. Should probably not have any pull requests that's older than three months. We should probably not have issues that's older than six months. Uh, and we should probably have had a commit within like last 12 months to kind of indicate that we have some sort of activity here. We actually have someone who's actually having a hand on the wheel here and steering this project. Of the 125 projects we have, only 116 of them actually live up to the like baseline. So we have work to do here in ensuring that the contributor experience uh, and the general quality of our projects is actually up to par. And there's multiple reasons for this. Like one of them is that we, we don't really ask the right questions when we start a new project. So <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves, like how many hours do we actually want to dedicate to this? And why do we want to dedicate it? Like what do we actually want to get out of it? We also see that we don't really think about what does it actually technically mean that we move things from the inside out to the outside? How does that impact your internal stakeholders? On the individual level, we, we don't really talk about how can you use this in a promotion story? How can this impact your career that you're actually engaged into open source? And um, when does open source project have, you could say, priority over other work? Like when is it that we say, no, it's actually more important that we finish the sprint on the open source project rather than fixing some bug that was discovered? When when do we deem more things more important? So again, it also goes back to like, what determines success and failure? Like when do we know if, uh, if an open source project is successful? And <clears throat> do we know when it fails? And um, do we ever ask ourselves, like, is it actually time to shut this thing down? Or is it time to double down and put more resources on it because it shows promise? So in summary, we have, you would say, generally speaking, a quality and longevity problem across our projects. So this impacts the contributor experience. It impacts the outside perception of our commitment to open source. It impacts security and supply chain risk for our adopters. Um, and also, I think it's really important to say this is no one's fault. We just never assigned like ownership or defined what ownership actually meant for open source. You also really didn't have a roadmap or reasoning for doing this. So how can you succeed and how can you even fail? And if you can't even judge if it's a success or a failure. So we also know that 
Spotifyers are investing a weekends and free time into projects. And we don't know if they're succeeding. We don't know if they're failing and we don't really know the return on investment of this work. And you can say the second order impact of that is that when we can't tell the difference between success and failure, how do we decide if we discontinue or double down? Are we missing out on the next backstage or are we spending our time on efforts without impact? So a quick uh, root cause analysis to just like summarize this whole thing <clears throat> is that we have this quality and longevity challenge because there's no one keeping the projects in a reasonable state. And that likely happens because we don't formally prioritize resources in, in regards to like people and, and time. And because we don't really keep open source projects in our prioritizing rounds and we don't really have an estimated business value of why we want to do this, why it makes sense. And this likely happens because we don't apply our operating principles to open source and we also lack purpose of why we do these efforts. That's kind of the straight with our root cause analysis. So I know the last slide was a bit depressing, so just um, have a, a PowerPoint palette cleanser here in the in form of this like fluffy unicorn, and then I can also drink some water. So I think also it's important to be clear that despite these challenges, we have a lot of good things in place. We have a lot of really interesting projects. We have a good mindset and we have all the basics in place. We just want to be a bit more ambitious than the average tech company and, and define this more as work and trying to avoid these you say, pitfalls of people investing time into things that doesn't really have an impact. So that brings me to the next part of this, which is really how do we define open source work inside of Spotify or redefine it? So generally speaking, we want to elevate open source work, uh, focusing on impact and purpose. So it's time to work a bit backwards. Um, our goal is that open source work is prioritized on equal terms to core business work. To get to that point, we need teams committed to doing that, to saying, we actually want to do this thing. And these are the specific open source related goals we have in our team KRs. And that goes back to having team level ownership, but also having a very defined purpose for why we release and contribute to open source. So it starts with the purpose and starts with the ownership of the team. So that means that we need to have a change of focus, not just releasing code, but actually how do we take ownership long-term for a thing we want to put out there? Because nothing is an overnight success. This requires commitment over time and also a willingness to prioritize this over less important things. So to facilitate ownership, we need several things. We need, first of all, to have better tooling in place for our maintainers so there's less friction uh, maintaining a project. Our setup tooling should pretty much be on par with our internal tooling. So open sourcing a code base does not give you additional friction as a, as a team. Um, you should be able to test things the same way. You should be able to distribute things the same way. You should have the same security guidance and so on as we kind of have inside of Spotify now, uh, because that's one of our, our big assets of, of working internally is that we have all this tooling in place. Secondly, we need to have the data in place to know if we're winning, if we should double down or we should stop investing. Um, so we should have a better idea of when our projects are succeeding, when we see growth in the areas we actually want to have, um, so that we can make better decisions. Right now we don't have that, and right now we don't really look at the numbers to make decisions, and we should start doing that. And this is also a tooling aspect as well. We need to be able to collect these numbers and easily uh, present them and digest them for the company. And then there's the last part, we also need to make ownership sustainable. That means that you as a team or as an individual need to have the hours dedicated to this and have the argumentation for doing so. So saying that you want to invest 10 hours into a project, these hours are reserved to actually have the working time to, to work on this project and not something that just like is pushed away when something more important comes along. Um, or this important really. Um, so again, that goes into also like finding a justification why you want to do this. So a bit about the reducing the friction because some of these things are already uh, ongoing. Um, we have established a open source hub on Backstage, there's a link at the end of the presentation, uh, where we are collecting all these different open source projects. This is also going to be the place where we're going to register team level ownership. So any project, we can see who are the owning team, who is accountable, who will take responsibility for keeping it up to date. It will also contain metrics for you as well, and we'll also uh, give our uh, tech recruiting team uh, 
access to who is actually contributing to our different projects so they can also use that information for potential hiring in the future. Um, we've also redesigned the release process already. So a lot of the questions I actually put into this presentation is already part of that release process. So we kind of try to challenge your thinking about why you want to do this and why you want to invest a certain time in this. This is not a gatekeeping mechanism. This is still saying it is your responsibility to get, to get value out of doing this. But you also need to understand why you're doing it. It's like the argumentation of doing it because it's the right thing to do doesn't really stick. You know, need to kind of dig it a bit deeper to kind of justify why you want to spend 10, 20 hours a week on a project. And that's okay. It's okay that we try to justify these things so we can also measure if the things are going well or not well. Another thing we already put in place is funding for our dependencies. This year we have 100,000 euros in the FUS fund. Um, again, this is to think of ownership, not just on our own projects, but also thinking about it as end-to-end -end ownership in the sense that we have a lot of people we rely on to do the right thing. They are generally outside of our sphere of influence. So um, we want to put things in place so we can actually control the environment a little bit more. Uh, and that we can do by giving them, them uh, funding. So they actually have the funds or the means to either hire people to do work on their project, or it also gives them a bit of motivation to put some of their own time into it and so on and so on. Um, so it is a way to reduce the risk of depending on something. So we avoid costly migrations in the future, but also to give these maintainers uh, the funds to actually maintain their code. And also this is because we believe that creators should be paid for their work. Um, um, as a principle for our company, not just for musicians, but also for, for open source developers. And of course, all these changes should also be done um, <clears throat> with respect to our culture. So we should still have room for experiments and for big bets. We should be allowed to be ambitious for open source projects so we can have bets like backstage in the future. We should also at the same time have a mind, be mindful of, of allowing experimentation such that projects such as Pedalboard um can be released as well um and there is easily uh, freedom to do this um and again i think an experiment is something where you have a goal and you have an end date where you evaluate how it went and looking at, at both these projects they are success but they came uh, towards open sourcing with very different objectives um, and reasons to doing so so in summary we can really only have significant impact with our open source efforts if we start treating open source work as work. Um, we want to transition from something you do in after hours to something we actually support as a core business activity. We need to prioritize this equally to core business things. That means that the thing that doesn't make sense, that might actually be harder to do. And that is actually OK. Uh, but then again, on the other hand, if we see promise, if we see impact, we also want to be able to double down. That's also what we want to enable you to do. So for you again to walk away with this in summary, I would like for you to, to think of open source in terms of ownership rather than releasing code. Uh, nothing is an overnight success. Um, just throwing the code out there is not gonna make anyone adopt it. It is the continued like maintainership and ownership that is actually the core value of open source. And we need this ownership and prioritization because this is like, a bet on long-term quality projects rather than just releasing as much code as possible. Um, again, nothing is an overnight success. This might take months or even years to build up a community around your project. And um, a lot of these things will fail. Only 2% of the projects basically succeed. So we do want to create an environment where you can experiment and, and prioritize code. And then the other hand, with ownership also comes a responsibility to measure, learn, and adapt. Um, seeing that if you can see in your own metric that you really don't have the time to prioritize pull requests, or you see no response to releases, there's no adoption, or you internally have already moved on to something else, and you don't really care about this thing anymore, then you also have a responsibility to just actively make the decision to either pass on ownership to someone else who can maintain it, or just discontinue the project. There's no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's why we experiment. That is to learn and adapt and measure. And then we can always do something else, or we can just like discontinue it. Or maybe there's already some other people out there on the internet who just want to fork it and, and continue the work. And that is totally fine. We are not in this game to have as many projects as possible. We would rather have 20 really, really good active projects that creates value and impact rather than having 300, which is just a large number, but very hard to maintain. <clears throat> 
And finally, we want to prioritize work which has a positive impact on our business, your team, and your career development. And again, that's also according to our operating principles. Um, and there is many, many good reasons for doing open source that can have a positive impact on our business for the purposes outlined in the beginning, also for your team, and also for your individual development as well. So it's not that we lack reasons. Um, we just need to focus on them and focus on the right things to do. And that's where we want to prioritize.